My name is Cynthia Rathanasamy, and I'm an MPP here at the Ford School, and I'll be your moderator today. So on behalf of LSTAM, I'd like to welcome you all to the first of the policy, Ford Policy Union debates. These debates, sponsored by the Ford School's International Policy Center, are int intended to bring informed discussion of international policy issues of importance and interest to the students of the Ford School, the University of Michigan community, and the wider, wider policy world as a part of the Ford School's mission to educate the future policy makers. The International Policy Center plans to host several of these events over the remainder of this academic year and continue the series in subsequent years to enrich the educational experiences of students, bring the leading voices on key policy issues to the Ford School, and contribute to the wider, more informed discussion. Today's topic is the issue of U.S.-China relations, and in particular, U.S.-China trade relations. I will explain the conduct of the debate in a moment, but first I'd like to welcome our two participants. First, let me introduce Dr. Pete Navarro, a professor of economics and public policy at the Paul Marais School of Business in the University of California, Irvine. Welcome. Thank you. Our other participant. <laughs> Our other participant is Dr. Phil Potter, an assistant professor of public policy here at the Ford School, specializing in international security and American foreign policy. Um, if you all could please, oh, and welcome as well. <laughs> If you all could please refer to your programs for their full biographies, they have more, much more information in there. So our debate today will be conducted in a fashion similar to a competitive forensic debate, but with the difference that there will be participation by the audience. The debate will center on the following question. Whether China's trade and membership in the World Trade, World Trade Organization are not the primary causes of job losses and weak growth in the United States. Dr. Potter will be advocating for the passage of this resolution, while Dr. Navarro will argue against passage. In all rounds of the debate, Dr. Potter, as the advocate, will go first. The debate will begin with each debater giving a 12-minute opening statement on this argument, with the argument for resolution by Dr. Potter uh, opening the debate. And then Dr. Navarro will go, and two minutes of his 12 will be used to show the trailer for his film, Death by China. Following the two opening statements, each debater will then make a five-minute closing statement. The debate will close with questions submitted by the audience. As you came into the auditorium, you all received index cards and we'll plan to collect those after the opening statement. Please write whatever question you may have on there and people will come around and collect them. Uh, and we'll continue to ask as many of those questions as time allows during the audience portion. Following the audience questions, we will then evaluate the results in two uh, the debate in two ways. First, we'll take a vote of the audience by show of hands, so I'll ask all of you just to raise your hands and ask, also ask for some patience as we just count, because there's a lot of people here. Uh, as we're doing this, um, Ms. Maria Liu up here in the front will serve as our forensic debate judge, and she will also provide her expert opinion on who she believes won the results of the debate. Finally, after all that counting and evaluation, we'll submit, we'll tell you all who won, both in your opinion and Maria's opinion. Uh, finally, after the debate has concluded, there'll be a few minutes while we clean up and organize everything for a showing of the film, uh, Dr. Navarro's film, Death by China. So please stick around if you'd like to watch that. And then once again, welcome to our ongoing series of international policy debates. And I'm going to just move over there and we'll get started. All right, so Dr. Potter, you have a 12 minutes to go ahead with your opening statement. Let's see if I've mastered this. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Um, so I am not a debater um, by training, so I will probably now break every rule and convention of that discipline. But uh, here goes anyway. So what I'm going to argue is that the WTO is not the primary cause of, of uh, or China's entry to the WTO is not the primary cause of our, our current economic difficulties. And more generally, that we need to be taking a more nuanced view of the US-China relationship than what uh, is, is being proposed in, in this film that you're going to see a, a trailer for in a moment. And then I believe the full movie will show afterwards if you're interested in staying and taking a look at that. Um, the reason for that is that at its core, China is now a major power, and we need to be taking seriously how we want to deal with China. We're not in a position to dictate terms in the way that I think this discussion suggests we could, and still achieve US strategic interests. Right? By pursuing some of these uh, kind of cracking down on China paths, we're actually likely to undermine our own self-interest. So, at its core, I really question sort of what this movie is for. 
right? It seems to be about sort of stirring up passions in the US, about exciting people for a certain course of political action. In a lot of ways, it strikes me as uh, something that is very much at home in the current debates uh, regarding the presidential election. Um, but I see this as much more an inherently complex situation. And more than that, that oversimplifications of this kind are, are not benign, uh, they're not clarifying, and they can, in fact, be dangerous. Um, so the first reason for that, I think, is that this and a lot of arguments about the deficiencies of China and the international system sort of harken back to these good old days arguments, right? And I think one needs to be very careful about that in the US, right? And specifically, I'm referring to stories about how, you know, in the 50s through the 70s, uh, a man could have a blue collar job and his wife could stay at home and they could have a car and life was good, right? Um, first of all, Household income in the U.S. was $25,000 adjusted for U.S. dollars now. It's roughly double that now. There are issues of inequality, some of which China has something to do with that we should be paying attention to, and I'll return to that for a, in a minute. But I don't think that it, this is a, a cut and dry case where we want to be returning to the past, right? Second of all, that past was very much the product of a very odd historical moment in which we were coming out of World War II. We controlled half of the global GDP. Right? This is not something that's likely to be replicated. Okay? And so we need to start thinking about how we grapple with other major powers, other major economic powers, rather than, than cracking down on them. So the reason for, for this, is, I think, is that blaming China is really pretty easy, right? but they're not fundamentally the problem. Manufacturing output in the US has actually been relatively consistent since the 1940s. That line is actually quite flat with some bouncing around the mean. Um, of course, the number of people employed in manufacturing have, has declined almost linearly over that same period. Okay? The reason for that is not China, right? It's machines, it's computers, it's productivity. Okay? Second of all, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Broke a debating rule, I'm sure. Um, second of all, uh, manufacturing as a share of global GDP has also been in, in decline over this period. Right? And the, the share of US GDP has, has gone right along with it. Again, much longer time series than you see with just entry, China's entry in the, into the WTO and representing a broader global phenomenon that we need to be taking, paying attention to. Right? Manufacturing just isn't the way to prosperity anymore. And this is sort of the, the, the fundamental thing that, that we're missing here. Both in the US and globally, the path forward is not through manufacturing. Okay. Um, finally, China's entry into the WTO, it, it's a singular event, right? It comes in in 2001, late 2001 specifically, right? And pinning everything that's happened after that with all its complexities, with sort of U.S. rises and declines, I think really washes out a lot of the information we want to know, okay? Um, first of all, we entered a, a recession in, in 2001. Right, and when you look at the, the, maybe some of you have seen this, there's kind of a pretty graph that got kicked around pretty frequently uh, with the decline in US jobs and manufacturing that seems to go down in 2001. I'd actually point to that same graph as evidence that something else is going on. China entered in late 2001. The trend is already falling off the cliff prior to that. Right, we have things like 9-11 in 2001. I could name any number of events in that period that could have uh, important shifts, uh, important effects on the U.S. system, okay? Um, so China's had some impact. I'm not trying to, to say that they've had no impact, but it's been dwarfed by larger shifts in the global economy. Specifically, I think points where uh, Dr. Navarro is correct is that there are some issues uh, with particular regard to intellectual property, uh, with regard to property rights. Um, things that are not problems uh, are things like currency manipulation. Uh, just being in Beijing and talking to a lot of business leaders uh, at the beginning of the summer, a lot of people in U.S. business circles are concerned that if China floated its currency, it would go the other way, not the way that we are, are insisting in Congress that it's likely to go. Okay? So part of the reason I think we need to be very careful about this and that these are not just statements that are, in my opinion, factually incorrect but are potentially damaging are issues of unintended audiences. Okay? I'm not trying to draw an overly uh, strong parallel here, but we've seen what happens when you put movies out that, that reach the wrong people. 
right? And I'm specifically referring to this, this movie that we've been dealing with uh, in the broader Middle East, which is, has enraged a lot of passions. Throughout this movie, uh, Dr. Navarro has sort of caveats to say, well, you know, there's the big bad Chinese government, but we do love the Chinese people, okay? I would put forward to you that the Chinese people are not out of step with the government in this direction. If anything, Chinese people have lower opinions of US behavior, right, and would like to see the government take a stronger line against us, right? Um, and that this is something we need to be paying a fair amount of attention to. Right? We assume on some level that at a popular, at, at a popular level, uh, if the, the Chinese government went away, then the Chinese people would be our friends. It's false. Okay? On this same trip to Beijing, uh, some Ford School students and I sat through a fairly lengthy diatribe by a member of the economics ministry who pointed out that the U.S. is sorry, I'm trying to think of a more civil word for it, uh, ruining China's day um, because of control of the, of the reserve currency, because of our control of international institutions, uh, because of our control of an international system in which they were a late comer. Okay? And so what I want to say is that our, China's presence in the WTO is actually a very positive thing for the U.S., Right? It brings China to the table, and it brings us into a conversation with China where otherwise we might be at direct loggerheads. That conversation doesn't always go well, doesn't always uh, work smoothly, we don't always get what we want, but it's a hell of a lot better than the alternatives. Okay? So, Rather than China exploiting us, I think it's much more productive to think of this in terms of a mutual hostage situation, okay? Yes, absolutely, China owes, uh, we, has an enormous amount of our, our debt, and that's a problem, right? But this also poses substantial problems for China, right? It prevents efficient investment, right? It uh, inflates, uh, and on the U.S. side, it's inflated asset bubbles, okay? So, you know, this is, this is not a good thing. It's something that both sides need to back off in a serious way, but that's done through conversation, right? In a mutual hostage situation, you can't dictate terms, okay? And I, I would posit that that is very much where we are. Um, so the, points, uh, the point that I'd like to make here is that uh, Navarro's film is, is both sort of wrong and antiquated, and the real question is what we're going to do when China falls on hard times, okay? This film is very much geared towards the U.S. falling on hard times. But I think the real question for us is what happens when China falls on hard times. And I think that's likely to happen fairly soon. Inflation is very high. Some of these same issues we've talked about, about, product, uh, about uh, productive investment, are coming home to roost. Right? From the Chinese perspective, they didn't kick us while we were down. Right? They did it in their own way, but they uh, stimulated when we said they should stimulate. They played, they played ball with the global system. Okay, and I think for a lot of Chinese people, the real test is going to come when, we, when it comes time for us to reciprocate. And what concerns me about movies like this and a lot of the dialogue that comes out of uh, the presidential elections and out of the Congress is that the U.S. is much more inclined to take advantage of the situation. And if you're going to take advantage of the situation, you better finish the job. Because this is a country that is uh, gigantic in population, has an enormous amount going for it, and is likely to rebound regardless of what we do. And when they rebound, it's going to be a heck of a lot harder for the Chinese government to make the case to the Chinese people that they should be cooperating in a system that we designed and ran, and in many ways privilege our interests. Thanks. How y'all doing? Yeah? Last time I was uh, at the U of M was literally 45 years ago and I jumped out of a plane. It was weird. My brother went here and he made me go skydiving. And uh, this might be just the same kind of experience. <laughs> um, the question before us is fairly simple. Uh, is China's entry into the World Trade Organization responsible for the last 10 years, essentially, of the economic misery that we've endured here in the United States? That, that's the question. So let's stay focused just on that for a minute. If you look at the five and a half decades 
prior to 2001, our gross domestic product in this country averaged 3.5%. And life was pretty good. Once we hit 2001, for the last 11 years now, that GDP growth rate has fallen to 1.6%. 3.5% to 1.6. Now, two percentage points, roughly, may not seem much, but 1% is 1 million jobs you don't create when you lose it. Two a year for 10 years is about 20 million jobs, and that's about what we need right now to put everybody back to work. We have an unemployment rate which looks to be at 8.3, but for example, the unemployment rate dropped the last, at the last report, but only because 400,000 people dropped out of the labor force. 400,000 people. There, by, by my estimate, and by the estimate of many economists, there's 25 million people in this country that can't find a decent job. Now, it's true that the forces of globalization started long before 2001. But something happened that year. You can blame it maybe, on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. You can blame it on the war on terror. But the other elephant in the room is China's entry into the World Trade Organization. If you look at the history of our economy, the problem on this last decade did not begin in 2007. Make no mistake about that. Here in Michigan, which was ground zero for the problem, the recession started back in 2001 and just kept going. Okay? There was never, never any recovery here. And you've got General Motors, one of the biggest corporations in the world now, saved by our government, off offshoring not only its production to China, but also its research and development, which is where the new jobs come from. So something happened. If you look at the statistics, they're pretty simple, and you'll see them in the film. 50,000 factories gone. Six million manufacturing jobs out of here. Now, this whole notion, which is common to academia, that you don't really need manufacturing base anymore. You don't need an industrial base. That we're all going to be running around in suits, and life's going to be OK, really doesn't make sense. If you look, for example, at one of the strongest economies in the world, Germany, 25% of their women and men are in manufacturing. What do you think it is for us? What do you think? Take a number. Ten. Ten. Yeah, but it's nine. And it's still going down. Okay? And when I talk about manufacturing in America, I'm not talking about t-shirts. Well, they're gone forever to Honduras, and, and so be it. Great. But the difference between countries like Honduras and China is Honduras will buy our stuff. And probably they won't go to war with us. Okay? Now, Here's the thing about the World Trade Organization. China joins it, and that would have been fine if they had done what they said they were going to do, which is play by the rules. Okay? What does that mean? It means no illegal export subsidies and respect for intellectual property. Now, since that time, because of weakness here in the US, they've broken every single rule in the book. The currency manipulation, which 40% which advantage alone, okay, just on that. And then you have, you'll see a wonderful scene in the film where this guy, Dan Slane, Bowling Green, Kentucky, 2002, because China got in. He was forced to move his furniture company over to China or go out of business, right? And so, so he's over there, and he makes stuff, and he makes it at cost, right? ships it over here, dumps it over here, because businesses don't generally do stuff at cost, right? The way he made his profit, the Chinese government gave him a check every month for 17% of his revenues, okay? That's huge, okay? Now, the other thing what's interesting about the World Trade Organization is that it is absolutely silent on two things, worker abuses and in environmental abuses. In other words, you can do anything you want, anything you want to your workers, or the environment, there's no ability to complain to the WTO. And the biggest flaw with the WTO is that you have to take it 
case by case by case, and any case that you file takes three or four years. And often by the time you get relief, the problem's gone. The factories that you were trying to save are gone. So this is a serious issue, and, and if the people of Michigan, if, if, if most of you are sons and daughters of the people of Michigan, I would assume, the people of Michigan can't understand how important manufacturing is by the fact that you see now what has happened, that it's gone and nothing's really replaced it, then we've got issues here in this country. Now, um, in terms of wh what needs to happen going forward, I really think we, we need to talk about whether, whether this country needs to be in the World Trade Organization at all. I mean, if you think about um, what it is, I, I remember when I was shooting the film, uh, one of the worst things that happened was I had this really good interview with a lawyer who prosecuted cases at the WTO. And he told me things like, yeah, there's over 150 countries in the WTO and most of them don't like us, okay? So uh, we're not gonna get much justice there. The funny thing about that interview was simply that uh, <laughs> um, when we shot it, we lost the sound on it. It was the one interview we had where, uh, where that happened. It was kind of the worst case for, for a director. Now, uh, what I've been doing with the film is, is um, going throughout uh, the Midwest. I spent a lot of time in Ohio. Let me just tell you a couple of stories so you kind of understand kind of what I'm hearing from the grassroots. For example, I go to a place like Mansfield, Ohio. It used to be a huge steel making town. There's a mill there, AK Steel. It's about a mile long, about a mile long, okay? And you can cut that thing in half, and half of it now is nothing but weeds and grass and, and, and beat up concrete. And what happened to that half, half of that plant, a cold finishing mill, is it was boxed up and shipped off to China. And now that plant competes against American steel makers. You'll see in the film, there's this guy, Tom Danzig, who talks about the irony of China being the highest cost producer, check this out now, highest cost producer of steel in the world with the lowest price, okay? That can only happen if there are legal, illegal export subsidies. But when you take half a plant from, from a place like Mansfield, you take out not only the, the steel worker jobs that go with it, but all of the surrounding support jobs. I was in Portsmouth. Portsmouth, Ohio, down, uh, it's a beautiful town. Anybody ever been there, anybody? Portsmouth, it's a it's beautiful river, they could Portsmouth, hence Portsmouth. Um, there was a young man there who had just graduated from college. He wanted to be a teacher. The best work he could get was occasionally a sub. But the tax base of Ohio has been so decimated by the loss of the manufacturing base that they're cutting teachers left and right, and cutting, cutting bud budgets left and right. So the only place he could work was Walmart, which was some high irony. But what he told me with tears in his eyes, and he told the people in the audience was, his grandfather, who was a World War I veteran, he wanted to go to and, and uh, basically honor him with a flag on the grave, and he couldn't find an American flag that wasn't made in China. And there's something something really desperately long with it. So the bottom line here is, it, this is a mystery, okay? You solve it. You look at the statistics and you give me a counter hypothesis as to why in 2001, like a step function down, everything's gone. You tell me if you can compete here in the state of Michigan with a co company over in Chengdu run by the state government, that has the advantage of currency manipulation, that has the advantage of illegal export subsidies, that may have taken your own technology and taken it over to use against you, can dump anything in the river, anything in the air, and keep its workers working 16-hour days, seven days a week, and often not pay them. And I think some of you may have noticed the news today. Anybody see that? 2,000 workers. 2,000 workers at a Foxconn, i.e. an Apple factory in China, rioted, and it's just like the Pinkertons back in the Ford days, right? They sent in 5,000 stormtroopers to keep those folks under wrap. So bottom line is, um, 
I never say enjoy the film, because that's not the kind of film it is. It is alarming, but I reject the idea that it's alarmist, because everything in there is factual, and the 50 people you will see in there, every one of them um, is an expert in their own way that tells a very simple truth, and it's a very, very nonpartisan film, neither right nor left, but it's about right or wrong. It's an American film. Thank you. I was laid off three times within six months until I was permanently laid off. I graduated with my bachelor's and I haven't been able to find anything. Jobs disappear and the way the economy is going right now, it's tough to find a job. When the workers in China are being abused, then workers in America have a tougher time competing against them. Five and a half million manufacturing jobs are gone. 57,000 manufacturing facilities closed in this nation. Some of the workers at companies, literally their last act at the factory was to unbolt the machine and load it up to be shipped off to China. There's no question that a large part of China's competitive advantage has come from environmental neglect. 16 of the world's 20th dirtiest cities are located in the People's Republic. That leads to carbon emissions and particulate matter falling all along the coast of the United States. If you put it in your mouth or the hands of a child, don't buy it from China. They're not only ruining our economy, they're poisoning our children with the toys that we give them. China until today is a totalitarian regime. It's a dynasty, no republic, not people's country. China's military power is strengthening very, very rapidly. And it's developing a modern, well-equipped, technologically capable military. China is the only major nation in the world that is preparing to kill Americans. We're a subsidiary of China and getting worse and worse because they're going to own us pretty soon. If we talk about who's to blame, I think partially our own government. Our government should be doing something. They could have stopped in, I think, a long time ago. Please hear us. I think that at every level, people could boycott and there would be a shot heard around the world. Dr. Potter, you have five minutes for your response statement. OK. So uh, maybe we should have started with that, because it gives us, I think, a better idea of why uh, this movie sort of alarms me a little bit. I would say it's alarmist, right? I mean, images of World War II looking jets replace Asian people here with Chinese, carpet bombing the US, um, a buoy knife blood dripping out of the continental United States. I mean, you know, maybe alarmist is, is not the right word, but I might one up, okay? Um, so, you know, Dr. Navarro gave us some, some really touching anecdotes, but then challenged us to look at the numbers a little bit, okay? So I would say, but let's start there. Let's look at the numbers, all right? Um, this supposed cutoff in 2001, right, where you have over 3% growth prior to that, 1.6% uh, growth after that. So, uh, you know, here at the Ford School, we like to do a fair bit of, of analysis. I think this should be well within your reach. What happens to those numbers if we shift the cutoff to 2,000? You still have high on one side, low on the other. If we cut it to 2,005, or better, better yet, 8, right, you have negative on the one side and positive on the other, right? So my point is this, this supposedly smoking gun cutoff at 2001 is arbitrary, okay? And it, it looks compelling if you sort of say that the number's on one side or the other, uh, but that, that is not smoking gun evidence. That's not what smoking gun evidence looks like. In general, China has consistently lagged behind the US several steps on the value chain. Okay, and so this is part of the problem with the story that, the, that China is taking American jobs, right? China's comparative advantage, despite what's been claimed here, is actually low-cost labor, okay? That's what they've got. They've got people. This isn't terribly complicated, okay? Unfortunately, and I think the Foxconn example is a great, a great pointer for this, that's been changing, right? China's been having a lot of problems recently because they're having trouble competing on price, for the lowest cost labor, which are jobs they took from the rest of the developing world, not from us, 
right? They're having trouble competing on price for labor, and they're having a really tough time moving up the value chain to the kind of things that we do well. Okay, and this is what really concerns me about this story we keep hearing that we need to be returning to manufacturing, right? The Chinese are desperately trying to figure out how to, how to get the heck out of manufacturing, okay? It makes very little sense for us to turn around and say, that's what we need to be doing, okay? The Germany example, I think, is, is a really good one, all right? Germany's in the WTO, right? What, what, why is Germany doing, given the, the facts that are presented, why is Germany doing well? And, and the U.S. Do, uh, not, it's the type of manufacturing that matters, okay? China has not been, been doing that sort of, the, the high-tech uh, machining, that sort of work that the Germans have long been very good at, right? And certainly it is true that having some manufacturing sector, the right kind of manufacturing sector, a German-style manufacturing sector, uh, is good for uh, your security interests. Those are things, those are capabilities you want to have. But these blanket statements about steel mills being hollowed out in Youngstown or wherever it might be uh, are, are, again, missing the larger point. Um, that's enough. Cool. Cool. Dr. Navarro, before you start your uh, response statement, I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, to please uh, give it to the three individuals at this top row here, um, and they will give it up to me. Okay, let's start, let's start with the data, first of all. The, the, the claim here is that the, the points are arbitrary, okay? But let, let's, let's look at the data. Let's start with jobs growth, okay? If you look at the, the average monthly job, net new jobs, which is the big number that comes out in the employment report, last one was like 90,000. If you look at that, we go back to the 1960s, right? Through that whole decade, we were, we were generating about a 160,000. We went to 1970, it was about 170,000 a month, okay? Our best year, our best year was the 90s, and that was 181,000 a month throughout the 90s. Once we got to 2001 for the last decade, okay, what is it? It's minus, minus 2,000. Minus 2,000. And that's not that's not like a single year, it's, 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 it's across years. It's not, it's not an, an, an aberration, it just does that. Same thing with personal income, okay? Our average median household income grew 18% in the 80s, 16% in the 90s, went to zero, zero in the 2000s. Something happened, something happened. Now, the thing that, that I find to be most counterfactual is the idea that cheap labor is the source of China's competitive advantage. If that were true, Bangladesh and Cambodia would be powerhouses. I spent two years studying the sources of Chinese competitive advantage at UCI. And the study I did came up with the fact that, yeah, cheap labor matters, okay? But it was the other five things the other five things, the currency manipulation, the illegal export subsidies, the counterfeiting and piracy, the pollution, the ability to pollute for profits, and the ability to abuse workers, which creates the real advantage in China, the real advantage in China. And so everything that the Chinese government is doing to gain competitive advantage, even as their labor costs start to rise, is contrary to the rules of the World Trade Organization. They cheat. You'll see in the film people talking about they cheat, they cheat. Now, in terms of the knife going through, yeah, that's a little bit of Hollywood. But I was in Los Angeles standing up with 12 people from China or Tibet. And this gentleman from Tibet says, when I saw that knife, first time I saw that knife, it was exactly how I felt about what the Chinese government has done to Tibet. Any Tibetans in the audience? Okay. Do you know what is being done to the Tibetans and the Uyghurs? These people are kept in, in essentially locked states, right? And they bring in Han Chinese to dilute the population. And they send the women out so they can't breed with Tibetan or Uyghur men as a way 
of pacifying those. These are the kinds of things that are going on that, that we, you know, we go about our merry way. We buy the cheap stuff. You'll see in the film. It's like you go ahead and buy the cheap stuff. But as Gordon Chang says in the film, yeah, yeah, things are cheap at Walmart, but we have to consider the consequences. So approach this like an academic. Look at the numbers. Look at the startling step function down. Look at how year after year since 2001, year after year, we've lost, steadily lost our manufacturing base, trend it out, see where we're going, and understand that unless we start producing things, and by the way, the Chinese are the largest producers of automobiles in, right now. Do you know that? They are the largest producers of automobiles, and they're going to aircraft, okay? Unless we start making things again, there are not going to be any jobs for everybody to prosper. Thank you. Great. Now we will proceed to the question portion. Um, and Dr. Potter, you will have the first question. What factors influence the movement of manufacturing jobs abroad? Are these all traceable to China's trade policies? Well, so so no, I don't, I don't think they're all traceable to uh, China's trade policies. The uh, U.S. has been losing manufacturing jobs for quite a long time. Right? As I said, a lot of this story is, is inevitable. Right? When we talk about this incredible vibrancy of our manufacturing sector, you're talking about a post-World War II environment in which we're primed and everyone else is decimated. Right? And we used that to lock in a lot of advantages in manufacturing that carried us for quite a ways. We also used it to lock in things like the WTO, which continue to help us out. Right? So as far as things that have, have shifted manufacturing jobs abroad, uh, as I said, the US has kept a fairly steady state as far as overall manufacturing production. Right? We've become a lot more efficient in how we do it. Uh, and we've done most of our economic growth uh, in other sectors, the financial sector, various service sectors. Um, and you know, I think this example that was brought up just a moment ago about the 1990s is a, is a perfect illustration of that. We did not grow in the 1990s because we got super good at building cars, right? We were not do that, that growth was not about manufacturing. That was a decade of unprecedented American growth. Uh, and it, w it was about things that we are, frankly, right now, better than China at. And I think that's where we need to be dedicating our attention. Dr. Navarro, the next one is for you. How can the U.S. avoid starting a trade war with China at a time of economic uncertainty? Or are you advocating a trade war? <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a great um, part, part in the movie where Dan Slain, a member of the U.S.-China Commission, says that we're already in a trade war. And um, I think that's the case. It, it's, a, it's an undeclared trade war. Uh, if you think about what trade wars are, they're basically um, when one country uh, bends the rules for advantage. And China has, uh, has been doing that uh, very, very uh, effectively uh, since they joined, joined, joined the WTO. So I don't advocate a trade. Uh, see, here's what's the most interesting thing. If you simply take the currency manipulation issue, Okay? You just take that issue alone. They have an undervalued currency by 40%. Gives them an advantage. Um, it's basically like a tariff on our exports to China and a subsidy to their exports here. Now, that's worked for them up to this point in time. But if you were to let them strengthen their currency now, gradually, say, over a two-year period, it would solve the most fundamental problem facing the Chinese economy, which is they're too export dependent. In order for China to maintain a steady growth rate, they've got to sell to Europe and the, and the U.S. And now the US, U.S. and Europe are so weak, they can't do that. So a stronger yuan coupled with health and pension reform would give birth to a Chinese consumer and therefore uh, basically make that country strong, prosperous, and less in conflict with us. And here's a question that i like both of you to answer. Um, Dr. Potter, you can feel free to take the first whack at it. What are the next steps to achieving a more normalized trade relationship between China and the United States? I think a lot of it is, is continuing with what we've been doing, right, which is having conversations in international forums. Right, so we've, uh, you know, the car example just came up a moment ago. We don't like how China is, is handling their car exports, 
right? Um, well, are we better off in a situation where we force conflict and force China out of the WTO, which is a built-in forum where we, or as was posited earlier, remove ourselves from the WTO, where we don't have the opportunity to have conversations about these things, right? Everybody, in the end, bends the rules on the WTO, right? We, uh, the, the aforementioned diatribe we got from the Chinese economic ministry. I cut that off after about two and a half hours because it was moving into the discussion of all of the ways that the U.S. has manipulated the WTO to, to rip off China, right? We actually globally have a pretty lousy reputation as far as the WTO is concerned. Um, but it, may, it continues to be an important place where we can have conversations and it prevents us from having these sorts of spillages where suddenly economic concerns have no built-in place for discussion, they start spilling into security concerns. And, and this is what I mean about us needing to take seriously the implications of these arguments for our broader geopolitical interests. You beat the question. <laughs> what are the next steps to achieving a more normalized trade relationship between China and the United States? Um, my own view is that, that China respects strength and exploits weakness. And um, what we've been showing China for a long time now um, is either benign neglect in the Bush administration or flat out weakness in the Clinton administration. One of the first things that Hillary Clinton did, and I've been a fan of hers, but one of the first things she did in 2008 when she became Secretary of State is, is basically announce in a speech that she would not hassle the Chinese government about human rights, that it was all about trade relationships and national security things vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and things like that. Um, the Chinese will exploit that kind of weakness. Um, I believe uh, that if, if Barack Obama had kept his promise that he made in 2008 to the people of Michigan and Pennsylvania to brand China a currency manipulator, that if he'd kept that promise, that we'd have a stronger yuan and a more balanced trade with China. I think that uh, we just simply have to stand up for our own interest, not tolerate cheating, um, and, and I think that the Chinese government will respond positively to that. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Potter. The 2001 recession is commonly attributed to the bursting of the tech bubble and the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates too high. How does this explanation square with Dr. Navarro's assertion that China's entrance into the WTO is the primary cause of the U.S. economic woes starting at that time? It doesn't. <laughs> no, I mean, in, in, in all seriousness, though, I mean, the, the answer to the question is baked into it, right? I mean, the, the origins of the 2001 recession, which is often attributed, you know, it starts slightly before China's entry into the WTO, Right, um, and certainly before the effects of China's entry into the WTO are being felt on an economic level, right? Um, and what's often attributed to this sort of step function thing uh, that, that Dr. Navarro has referred to a number of times is that declines in declining sectors ha tend to happen in recessionary periods, right? So you're inefficient in important ways, uh, you're, you're being passed by, suddenly there's a lot of belt tightening, a lot of industries got, get shaken out, but the fact that the macroeconomic situation has, has changed means that when the rebound comes, that industry doesn't rebound to the same extent. Right? So that's a lot of the origin of this uh, supposed numerical blip that we see, which again, as I've said before, actually comes ever so slightly uh, before the, the supposed causal factor. Would it, would it be okay to say something there at this point? Sure, if you'd like to respond. Uh, look, um, again, this, the, treat this as a, as a mystery that you have to solve, okay? And, and then look at the data. It, it's pretty clear uh, that, that what happened after China came into the WTO and began using basically these illegal subsidies, it's pretty clear what happened, okay? You look, the first, the first industries that got hit were in the South. It primarily furniture yeah, and textiles. I mean, virtually within a two to three year period, half of those industries were wiped out. And that was all due to China. Those things went right to China, OK? And then as you, as you go through time, through today even, you, you see this spread first up into the Midwest, 
with things like steel and, 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 and autos, and then it spread to the rest of the country. So um, there's, no way, <laughs> there's no way you can explain 1.6 over a 10-year period when you had 3.5 over the fa past 5.5 decades. Um, there's got to be a reason, okay? And it can't be, oh, yeah, we had 9-11. That's not it. Okay, there has to be something. So you tell me what it is if it's not letting the largest populated country in the world come into your markets with cheap labor and ungodly unfair trade practices. Dr. Potter, would you like to respond to this since I gave him an opportunity to? This is a little off book, you don't have to, but. I mean, I'll, I'll just be very brief. Sure, which is, and I'll go to the I next question that, after that. I think by saying, you know, I, I, I would need to be able to look this up, but I'd be really interested to know what the numbers were uh, once we'd rebounded from the 2001 uh, recession and prior to the 2008 crash. My sense is that those are not consistently lousy numbers for U.S. growth. Um, uh, actually, you, you look at it. You'll I will, see it, yeah. it, it. You see that we, we, we've dropped into this lower padding. It's fascinating. Like the latest numbers that came out, uh, we're, ba we're back down at 1.6. Well, it's so like, like we're settling into this, this lower glide path. And you know, it's, it's like somebody get tenure studying this or a PhD thesis, okay? But I'm telling you that the numbers are really startling. I mean, we, we wouldn't grant PhD theses for, you know, single point predicts trend. That tends to be frowned upon. Um, but, but, but if you could explain why it happened, you could solve it. And that's what we're supposed to do in academia, my friend. Agreed. Particularly at a policy place. Agreed. I, I, so uh, my concern here is that we seem to be averaging it in the financial crisis, which has, again, as I've said, something to do with these asset bubbles, but has not a lot to do with this WTO entry. But like right? I said earlier, it's th not this, thing started, this thing started, okay? The, the, the idea that, that our economic woes began in 07 is absurd. And, and everybody in Michigan should know that because the recession and the slow growth basically began here and in Ohio and in Pennsylvania. And that goes back to 03 and 04 and has persisted throughout that time. And what's missing? The only thing that's missing is all the steel mills and the auto parts factories and the manufacturing facilities that are now gone. And you'll see Richard McCormick in there, an expert on this, he said, he'll go, gone, vanish. And that, that's what's missing. This has been a very good exchange, but I will move on to the next <laughs> question. Um, Dr. Navarro, is there a role for co cooperation and competition since the economies are so closely in intertwined? See, I, you know, look, I think that, that in, in, in one scenario, um, the relationship between China and the U.S. could be wonderful, okay? Um, you go, you'll see in the film, there's this, there's this great... Um, rhetoric by Bill Clinton talking about how we were going to let China into, the, into WTO and get access to the biggest market in the world and American companies are going to produce on American soil, sell into that market, okay? If the, if the Chinese government can make the move now, basically, and empower their consumers and move from a third of their economy consumption to two-thirds like Germany, Europe, and we are, okay? They would buy our stuff, we would make at least some of it here. Their standard of living would go up, and life would be good. That's what free and fair trade is supposed to be like. But we don't have that now. And until we have that, the relationship is going to be very, very, very conflicting as it is now. And, and you, know, you can just see what's going on with, with Japan and China and us being drawn into that to know that there's nothing alarmist about a prediction that there could be a hot war. I have a question for both of you, and Dr. Potter, you can start. Do U.S. consumers benefit from cheaper Chinese commodities? Yes. I mean, it, it, cheaper is good. There are, there are costs to that, right? I'm not making the case that this is a relationship that has uh, been perfect or that China does not engage in uh, some, some unfair trade practices, right? This is not a perfect relationship, right? Um, so yes, the U.S. Uh, US co consumers benefit from that, but in certain cases, there, there are downsides to that as well. I would say that in aggregate, the U.S. benefits. Um, 
But the point is that, the, you know, it, it's two questions, right? Whether this WTO entry is, is the key variable we need to be paying attention to, and whether these sorts of remedies that we're talking about are essentially taking a baseball bat to, to, to the problem, right? And whether we, in the end, would be a lot worse off for doing that. And I, I'm making the case that, yeah, we would be worse off for trying to uh, blow this thing up. Uh, sh sure, uh, look, um, here's, here's the choice, okay? Yeah, things are cheap at Walmart, as Gordon Chang says, but you have to consider the consequences. So, so here's one scenario. You, you have um, income basically zero for the last 10 years. You have 25 million people now out of work. And when they go to a Walmart, they can barely pay for anything. And it's nice to have the prices as low as possible. Scenario two, 25 million people have a job, and they have rising income, and they pay a little bit more for their stuff at Walmart. I like that word a lot better. Yeah. Dr. Potter, uh, the next question for you. How would you advocate addressing IP theft and illegal export subsidies? I, I think that this is something that we should be pursuing through the channels that we're pursuing it, right? I mean, that there are limited avenues to force China's hand, right? And this is, this is sort of the broader theme that I'm driving at here. I think there's this sense here uh, that this film is sort of putting out there, that we have tools at our disposal that in, in, involve compelling China to end practices like that, right? That, that era is gone. We don't have compelling tools of that regard without, in that regard without essentially withdrawing from the international system, right? So the question is, how do we get the most of what we want, right? How do we move in the right direction? And I think that's what international institutions do, right? They allow... Uh, powers to come together and in an iterated way uh, build collaboration, cooperation, and trust. That doesn't mean that that's a clean process. That doesn't mean that you immediately get to where you want to be. But these forums allow us to continually revisit the issue, to file trade claims, to hash that out, and hopefully in a stepwise manner move in a direction that we want to be moving in. I don't think the, uh, the alternative is, is either realistic I don't think this is something that we could do on a policy level. There's a reason that presidents uh, on the campaign trail tend to get tough with China. And then when reality comes home and they look at what tools are at their disposal, everyone tends to go back to the same course. Right? You could tell a special interest story, as Dr. Navarro does, about that. Uh, but I think the reality is that they're highly constrained in this relationship. Right? And so I think these, that's what uh, these international institutions are for. I think we're, we're very lucky that we designed the rules of the road and that by forcing China out and reshaking the whole situation, we're looking at a new order in which we would be significantly disadvantaged. Let me just ask you, though, uh, if you want to use these institutions, the White House, through the Treasury Department, has the duty every six months to consider branding China a currency and manipulator. And if they do that, that allows uh, the ability to introduce countervailing duties if China does not comply. Now, would you as president in 08 or 09 have branded China a currency manipulator? If not, why? Because what we did is behind the scenes, we pressured China considerably. But, but it's no not working. Hold on. It, hey, it is working. What's, well, how has it worked? Because Nothing's worked. I mean, we, we've lost, we've lost, we keep losing these jobs, the Excuse currency me. stays you, undervalued, and, and we, nothing works. I mean, they, the China just does what they do. If you guys are both okay with going on this exchange, we can sure. continue, but I'm I just fine. want to make sure yeah, it's okay no, with no, both of you. Set. Okay, um, go ahead. Uh, so you, you changed the nature of the discussion there, right? You said we kept losing jobs. Where it's worked is where it was supposed to work. On but, current, but the question well, was, let me, let me was just would you, have, you wouldn't have cracked down on China as a currency manipulator. No, that's not what I said. I said I would not have labeled them as a currency manipulator. I would have gone behind the scenes as we did and caused pressure on them, which has led to, to uh, increases in their currency over time. If you look at the trend in Chinese currencies, they've increased substantially. And the fact is there are broader underlying issues going on that have suggested that there has been a, a general rise, which now has Chinese currency about where it should be. This 40% number that you're giving me has very little in common with the numbers I hear as, from as business people in China. As a matter, okay, you can have a currency appreciating, maybe appreciated 20% at the most over time, but if the trade deficit's increasing at a faster rate, the undervaluation stays either the same or gets worse. Any, any macro class that you take, 
any macro class that you take, which talks about how trade is balanced. We'll talk about how it's through currency adjustments. It goes back to David Hume and the gold specie flow adjustment mechanism. And if China pegs the currency, it doesn't allow what's supposed to happen, which is in the presence of trade deficits, the yuan is supposed to go up, the dollar's supposed to go down, our exports are cheaper and you sell more to China, our imports are dear and we, we buy less and everything comes back into balance. So this idea that they've done something, like, oh yeah, it's gone up a little bit, it, it, if you've got a $300 billion deficit every year and rising, that currency by definition is undervalued, my friend. And, and I, I just, I don't understand, see, I, you, tell, you mentioned the special interest story. Yeah, it's the, in the movie you'll see how it's GE, GM, Caterpillar, then Boeing, basically, they love that currency manipulation because it allows them to go offshore, produce over there, dump stuff here. We can go on to the next question. Sure. Um, this is for you, Dr. Navarro. Uh, Dr. Potter said the advantage to having China in the WTO is that they have a seat at the negotiating table. If, as you say, they break all the rules, why not have an opportunity to hold them responsible? Well, there's two things. Um, we just, there's an interesting thing going on in the campaign trail. Romney comes out and wants to brand China a currency manipulator on his first day in office. Now, the advantage of that is that it's a global solution. In other words, if you, if you impose duties there, it would basically be duties and tariffs across the board and would help all industries in America offset that. On the other hand, Obama, when I was down in Ohio, in fact, in Columbus, the day I was there, he announced some additional cases before the WTO for auto parts. Okay, so far in his administration, he's done like eight cases. That helps very specific industries, but it leaves all the other industries apart. So the WTO is a very, very ineffective mechanism to basically bring somebody to the table on the question of unfair trade practices because you have to go piece by piece, industry by industry, and it takes too long. So a question for both. How do we encourage American investment in the US? Dr. Potter. I think uh, we, we, I don't know. Um, that's, that's a tough question. Um, I, I think that we, we want to continue to, uh, within the rules, subsidize certain industries, right? Again, this is a little bit like what the critique that China uh, lobs at us, right, is that you actually protect a number of your domestic industries, right? We've, we've been in the process of trying to, to grow a, uh, you know, a green energy industry, for example. And I think that, that technique like, techniques like that can have their place. Uh, but you have to be very careful because we run into charges of hypocrisy on this stuff fairly regularly, right? Some of these practices that, you know, China is doing, they're, they're looking at the situation and saying, uh, you know, you had uh, long periods in which you were uh, protecting domestic industries before you sort of loosed them on us. And now you tell us that you have to, uh, or, or even if you weren't actually protecting them, they were allowed to grow sort of free of competition. And now you're telling us as a developing country that, uh, you know, we have to play by mature country rules, right? Uh, that's a critique that we need to take seriously, because even if we don't believe it, it's, it's strongly felt. Well, um, interestingly enough, um, one of the things that draws our American multinational companies abroad is the differential tax system. And, and we go far beyond China on this. We have the highest corporate tax uh, in the world of, of the major producing countries. And so if Caterpillar, has a choice between um, Peoria and Chengdu, okay? It can move a new plant, right, and build it in Chengdu and get immediate huge tax break. I was in, I was in Cincinnati doing a town hall and after the film, this former uh, P&G, Procter & Gamble executive, since, I don't know if you know this, but Cincinnati is like Procter & Gamble land. They might as well call it Procter & Gamble instead of Cincinnati. Um, but he was an accountant and his whole job for many years was to evaluate where to put production distribution facilities. And he said that the only thing that mattered at the end of the day after he did his calculations was not labor, 
Labor costs had nothing to do with it. It was all about the tax system. So that, that would be one constructive thing that we could do uh, in terms of tax reform. And the other thing is, look, you'll see in the film, Alan Tonelson says, you know, these, these, these American-based multinationals that do not salute the American flag, they like the status quo. They like the cheap currency and the subsidies. If you take those away, they'll be more likely to come back here. And by the way, if we're going to bail out GM, we ought to have a little clause in the contract that says, hey, next plant you build, build it here. Uh, the next question is also for you, Dr. Navarro. Don't US companies benefit from cheap, cheap production abroad? Isn't greater efficiency in the US's interest as well? Uh, well, who's the U.S.? I mean, um, if you look, there's a great, great scene in the film, this guy, Ralph Gomery, um, who was uh, professor emeritus at, I think, MIT and very distinguished man. And he says, he says, he's talking about uh, Apple, and it's like the shareholders get the profits, um, but China gets the wages, right? And, and what America needs is wages. Right? So that's, <laughs> that's the conundrum. So uh, we're in danger in this country. I mean, this whole thing with Romney and the 47% thing, right? it's scary, if you think about it, to have 47% of the people in this country not paying any taxes. I was, I was in Calgary about four days ago giving a speech up there, and, and they were talking all about it, because in Canada, it's only 36%. It's only 36%. And so our percentage is rising and rising and rising because we've lost this manufacturing base and we've had zero wage growth. So there it is. I believe this is the last question. It's about 5.15. Um, and this is a question for both. And it's about human rights. How can the US promote human rights in China without being counterproductive? I think this is uh, like a lot of these issues, it's important to understand what we can do and what we can't do. Um, the reason that, that China engages in a lot of these practices that we're talking about, right, that promote, uh, that, that, that promote some of these uh, export imbalances is because they're deeply, deeply concerned with domestic employment, right? They're concerned about internal security, okay? They're concerned about regime preservation, all right? Um, when those are the stakes of your adversary, it's very important to sort of know what you're dealing with, right? And with, when those are the values that they think are on the table here, um, it, it, the, most of the tools we're talking about are not going to work for you, right? Because the stakes are too high. What they care about is more important than what you care about. I think you're, you're dealing with a, a similar situation with regard to human rights. Um, a lot of the, the, the ways in which people talk about manipulating the human rights issue uh, fail to understand the origins of those problems in the Chinese system. Okay, so I think we, it, it's very important both with trade and with human rights for the U.S. not to be uh, overly confident about how many tools we have in our tool bag for dealing with this. All right. That said, I think that there are practices that can be put in place involving sort of identifying human rights violations, um, you know, uh, boycotts of particular industries, um, tr bringing in, uh, you know, using trade rules to deal with uh, unfair practices as far as the, the overlap between human rights uh, and, and trade production, which Dr. Navarro brings into, into the film. Uh, so there, there are tools, and I think this is something that the U.S. needs to be concerned about, and it is something that we talk to the Chinese about every time we have one of these bilateral meetings. Uh, but part of the reason you don't see a lot of uh, either us banging our fists or them responding in, in, in kind is because there aren't an enormous number of tools we can do to, that, that, that'll allow us to sort of force the Chinese to start behaving uh, you know, in ways we want them to. This is really important. We gave away the most powerful tool we had to put pressure on the Chinese government on human rights when we let them into the World Trade Organization. Okay? And the history goes like this. Before China had most favored nation status, which was the precondition for entering the WTO, there was an annual rite of passage in Congress, basically, as to whether or not we were going to renew trade 
with China under the existing rules. Okay? At that point, there was some trade, but it wasn't a flood. Okay? So we did it. We did it every year, and every year we were able to use that debate to extract concessions from the Chinese government on human rights. Now, 1994 was the year that Bill Clinton, as president, loosened up on that. And you'll see in the film a guy named Chris Smith, conservative Republican who, who focuses a lot on human rights, just disgusted with that because it was a pure sellout to the multinationals that you'll see also in the film. But when we got to 2001, the vote that was held in Congress wasn't to let them into the WTO. It was to give them permanent MFN, permanent most favored nation status. And that was the best bargaining tool we had up until that point to have them abide by more humane human rights abuses. And you will see in the film, do we have any Falun Gong in this room? Does anybody know what that is, Falun Gong practitioners? Okay, you will see in the film that for the practice of Falun Gong Buddhism, it's probably the wrong word, tens of thousands of people have been put, not only put in prison, work in forced labor camps, but some of them have their organs removed while they're still alive by the government as part of an organ harvesting thing. That kind of thing, I mean, our government allows that. We, we allow that. When we go into a Walmart, we as consumers basically tacitly approve that kind of thing. The Christmas, there's a great scene, and this, I'll, this, I'll end it with this. Harry Wu was in a forced labor camp for 19 years. You'll see him in the film. He says in the film, China is a dynasty, no republic, not people's country. And he talks about from firsthand experience how the rubber boots we buy, the buttons on our shirts, the Christmas lights, and a lot of stuff in between are made in forced labor camps by people who get no paid at all. And, and when I was in Los Angeles that one time, along with the Tibetan, there was a woman on the stage who's in a movie now that's called Free China. And she sat there and told the audience that in 2002, she was a Falun Gong practitioner in a prison camp making rabbits, little furry rabbits that got sold out into the West. So the human rights issue is one of many, but I'm telling you, this country, as the greatest democracy in the world, has at least some responsibility to do a lot better on that issue than we're doing. Well, can everyone please join me in thanking our debaters to stand up for formal.